Awesome. We got a very interesting episode for you guys today with uh, none other than Galaxy Fight Club. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming to the next Aluva Talks. I'm really excited to talk about this one, guys. We got GameStop. We got Square Enix. We've got failed Formula One racing NFT games, Galaxy Fight Club. It's going to be a fire episode. It's like so much is happening in the space right now. Yeah, absolutely. So we have some very interesting topics and we might as well get started here. And uh, we're also waiting on Galaxy Fight Club to join as well. But uh, Andrew, I don't know if you want to go ahead and get started and we can kind of just uh, talk about the GameStop, I guess, here uh, before we get Galaxy Fight Club up. So I don't know if you saw the news of that yet, but uh, I thought that was pretty interesting. What's your what's your thoughts here? And and uh, Maxim, I see MX down there in the audience if you want to invite him up, actually. Oh, OK. Very cool. Give me one second. Yeah, there they are. Okay. Yeah, we'll we'll back the topics up too as well. So let's go ahead and get them up there. Great. So do you want to start with GameStop then, amigo? Yeah, yeah. So all right. Uh, what's your thoughts on that, Andrew? Yeah. So I mean, basically, for those of you that haven't been following this GameStop news, uh, and because you lost all your money um, betting on them <laughs> earlier, and you held the bags, uh, GameStop is basically launching an nft marketplace in partnership with immutable x and immutable x has just been killing it with their partnerships recently uh partnering up with huge brands uh across the board uh including esl gaming and uh, tiktok and the whole nine alluvium obviously we're partnered with them and the the question is is a gamestop nft marketplace something that customers want and need and is GameStop going to be able to add any real value to the NFT space with this partnership? We know that Immutable X's marketplace and their technology is really good. That's why Alluvium has selected them as our layer two partner, reducing those gas fees and, and helping grease up the blockchain wheels, if you will, to get things moving. Uh, so I feel confident in the Immutable X side of this partnership but I am not confident in the GameStop part of this partnership. Um, I don't see what value GameStop is going to add to the NFT space. I see this as a desperate uh, sort of, hey, uh, let's try to do a quick cash grab off of NFTs and see if we can open up and diversify new revenue streams through NFTs as a way to save our dying business. I think it's kind of too late. I don't think that GameStop has much to offer uh, in terms of value to, let's say, quote unquote, traditional gamers when it comes to NFTs. Uh, GameStop sure is a trusted brand in legacy gaming, and the brand name does carry with it some weight. However, when you look at communications and you look at conversations in mainstream gaming, and you ask the average mainstream gamer, uh, what do you think of NFT games? What do you think of crypto games and the whole nine? Uh, you know, about 90% of those people are either A, not going to know what you're talking about. B, have heard some headlines about EcoFUD or it's destroying the planet or you know minting NFTs on Ethereum kills baby seals. Or C, they're going to think it's just some sort of cash grab and it's yet another gaming company trying to take advantage of them and trying to take their money for very little value. And so I think GameStop is as, as like, let's say the legacy gaming brand, if you will, stuck in literally the oldest world of gaming possible, physical video games that you buy at a physical store in real life with physical money, trying to come over here to the NFT space, I think it's too much of a stretch. I don't think their customers are going to want this. And I don't think that GameStop really, I'm not seeing in their press releases or in these articles, GameStop doing anything meaningful or tangible or creative here that's going to spark the interest of consumers to purchase NFTs through their marketplace on Immutable X. Look, I'm rooting for Immutable X here. I want Immutable X's marketplace to blow up. I want that to happen, but I don't think that GameStop is going to be a, a strong partner for Immutable X. I think it's like a brand name that you put in your pitch deck that sounds legit, uh, but in terms of them actually driving customers and transactions and bringing in um, a lot of new eyeballs and a lot of new money into the NFT space. I think GameStop will utterly fail. And um, you know, and, and no offense to any 
um, GameStop holders out there that are listening right now, sorry uh, for the FUD, but uh, GameStop is not going to come back. It is a dead business model, and it's only a matter of time until they go completely out of business. And creating a shop on Immutable X is not going to be a major revenue stream that I think helps prop up their business moving forward. They are they are getting blockbustered, and there's nothing they can do to stop it unless they focus on things like original content and creating original products themselves in house. Them being a retailer or them being a middleman of products is over. That is now over. Decentralization is in place. It's cheaper and better and easier to buy digitally. And so if GameStop doesn't pivot with original content, original games, original intellectual properties, they literally have nothing to offer that 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 consumers want. So I I think that this has a 90% chance of failure, uh, but hopefully Immutable X will get some positive PR off of this partnership with GameStop to add legitimacy to their what I think is a, a quite impressive marketplace. Wow, so that is a very interesting take. Uh, so yeah, what stopped me from on the stock side, uh, and this is obviously not financial advice, was me looking into it and you know not really seeing a, a digital presence in you know having their own marketplace. So I thought that was interesting. You said that, and that's why you were you're you know obviously bearish is because they are stuck in that the physical side of you know e-commerce or commerce if you will and that it for me it, it does give me a little excitement that they are moving to immutable x and their order books you know will integrate a lot of the projects on there so i think that's great in terms of that and we'll see kind of how the plays out i think a lot of crypto you know natives are you know, maybe 50, 50 on it and we'll see what happens kind of thing. So, uh, I, I'm kind of undecided at the moment, you know, I, I, it, after this whole GME, you know, <laughs> squeeze, uh, thing, uh, it, it's kind of funny to, uh, to see them on immutable X and, uh, I am kind of rooting for them and hope, hope they do well. And, and I'll be definitely checking out their marketplace, but, uh, yes, we have two, uh, guests here. We got galaxy, fight club or at least the main account here with us today and then we have the literal cmo uh mx here with us as well mx how are you doing today i'm doing great thanks so much for having us um if you wouldn't mind pulling up guru as well um i sent you his username and um, he is part of the galaxy fight club community and i'm pretty sure people would love to also hear his voice and his take on things yeah, absolutely. And uh looks like he's joining as well. Welcome to the stage and happy to have you on and uh welcome. What up? Thank you. Appreciate Thank it. You. Thanks so much. Yeah, and so while we got while I have you here, uh could you guys give yourself a quick little introduction to the viewers or listeners rather out there that may not know who you are and could you guys give us a little bit about your background, why you got into the NFT space? and why you guys are developing Galaxy Fight Club in specific for everybody that has maybe never heard of your project before. And yeah, so a quick intro about yourself, and then also what made you guys want to build Galaxy Fight Club and what got you into the space initially? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so our team has uh, backgrounds in a variety of different industries. Uh, main one obviously being in gaming. Uh, my background specifically lies more on the marketing side. And uh, in, I'd say like June uh, of last year, maybe late May, Ju early June of last year, uh, we just scouted the NFT space. And we realized that at that time for anyone uh, who's been here back then, uh, I know it seems like forever ago, but uh, it was it was less than a year ago. Um, the whole space was essentially just cluttered with a bunch of really good looking but not really utility based profile picture projects and you know we, we we were thinking about how we can provide additional value to the whole space and that's where we came up with the idea of you know galaxy fight club which is essentially based on uh, a cross ip 
PVP game, um, which brings together the uh, intellectual property from all of these different uh, very, very big and um, hyped up projects um, and allows them to hop into the same game and play as their favorite characters. So I think a great comparison for um, any of the gamers in here is uh, thinking about Super Smash Bros. So you log into, you know, your, your, or you turn on your Nintendo, uh, if, it, if it was like a, a Wii or a GameCube or whatnot, um, and then you hop into Smash Bros, you can select Super Mario, but you can also select uh, Sonic or Link from Zelda or, you know, you name it. All of these different characters from like different franchises and galaxy fight club essentially is building the same thing uh in regards to the nft space so if you hold a, a cyber kong if you hold a board ape a karafuru a sub duck you know you name it uh you can take your favorite nft into galaxy fight club and uh yeah battle against each other uh and get that full like pvp uh, and excite, yeah, ex- full, full like PP experience, immersive excitement, uh, something that is not really present in the NFT space yet, um, especially not you know when, when it comes to um, the cross IP factor, and uh, yeah, that's kind of how it all got started, and we started developing you know last year, um, and just seen you know great success ever since. Uh, we implemented a bunch of different collections. Our game is approved on the Apple App Store, the Google Play Store. Uh, so people can literally just go into their, uh, or pick up their phone, go into the App Store and search for Galaxy Fight Club. They'll find our game. They can just download it. It's as simple as that. They can create an account. Um, we uh, screen their um, wallets and we check if they have any of the uh, NFTs who are already implemented in the game. And then they get assigned with, uh, their individual characters and stuff like that and then um yeah i think i think that kind of is like the the briefest uh overview or introduction that i could give into galaxy fight club but uh guru if you have something to add to that happy to uh to give a stage to you <laughs> yeah so I, I guess i'm up here as a super fan i don't know if that's good or bad for me but um uh, main gameplay right now is 3v3 so super fun game because it, it's very much a team aspect uh, there's a couple different collections and, and different partners in there. So the Arlen NFT is in there. Um, the big thing right now is is all about the weapons. So the cool thing Galaxy Fight Club has done is there's like f- over 50 different weapons, and there's a weapons collection, the GFC Genesis weapon. Uh, if you purchase one of those weapons and you've signed up with that wallet, you can immediately go and log into the game and use that weapon in the game. So it's very instant. You, you you purchase it or you know, we'll get into it, but you forge a new weapon and then boom, it's if it's in your wallet, it's in the game and you start using it. So the focus right now, just because people are starting to get competitive, there's tournaments coming up. Uh, they're learning about all the different weapons and the metas there and the strategy around each weapon, I think is something the team has done a really good job with is creating a very deep and robust gameplay for different styles of play, uh, which is an amazing thing to accomplish in eight months. Even more amazing that these assets are all owned and transferable, owned by the players. So bravo to the team for for such a success with the the depth and the breadth of weapons right now. <laughs> Appreciate it, Guru. But also maybe just to quickly add onto that, um, I just linked a tweet that we uh, posted a couple of days ago on the Galaxy Fight Club account, um, which shows the uh, Arlen uh, in-game character that we created in collaboration with you guys uh, over at Illuvium. So uh, I'm not sure how many people uh, who are listening in uh, remember this or have, have participated in the giveaway, but we gave away um, 500 of these uh, Arlen NFTs to the Illuvium community and uh, afterwards also gave away 500 of them to the Galaxy Fight Club community. And now anyone owning one of these NFTs can, um, yeah, basically access this uh, Illuvium Arlen character in game, uh, which as you can see, comes with um, her own stats. uh, So own health points and speed, uh, her own design, obviously. uh, And uh, yeah, depending on the weapon and obviously also having uh, different animations and stuff like that, which is pretty cool. Um, So, uh, I'd say for for any diehard Illuvium fan, uh, that's probably 
uh, the, the best character for you guys. Yeah, absolutely. It looks really good. Um, and yeah, I watched your trailer there and the game looks really fun. Like I'm a big Super Smash Brothers player growing up and, you know, would get maybe in a fight or two over the game. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, is the game actually live just out of curiosity? I don't know if you guys have already opened it up or what's, uh, what's that look like just out of curiosity. Yeah, it's um, it's live. So we're in open beta at the moment. I think we launched open beta about two weeks ago. Uh, and part of the open beta launch was, uh, you know, the process of getting approved on the Apple App Store and the Google Play Store. And I just linked another uh, tweet uh, in the uh, Twitter space, uh, which showcases some gameplay. So uh, for anyone interested, you can you know just click uh, on the very top of the uh, Twitter space window, and then you'll find the, the link tweet check out some gameplay and um yeah so we've been in we've been in closed beta for a couple of months i think we've been in closed beta since late november so uh yeah we, we had about um i think in the early days it was it was around 800 testers and we kind of moved that up uh to closer to like 1500 uh, or 1600 testers over time and uh just to obviously you know polish up the game make sure that there aren't any like major bugs and stuff like that before going into open beta uh, which is now accessible to anyone so uh, at this point in time if um, anyone was to just look up the game on their app store they can they can download it and hop in game uh, and you know play a couple of uh, games of uh, GFC um, yep. the only thing that's really missing at the moment is the uh, PDE mechanics uh, but those are almost uh, ready to be launched uh, and uh, yeah, we'll be we'll be releasing those in um, in early July. Yeah, I will say real quick. So everyone who's definitely download the game before you log into the app, uh, would recommend going to the Galaxy Fight Club website and creating an account that it, it asks for your email, and then that's how you link your wallet to the game. So the game is not actually going to connect to your wallet. You first GFC website, you log in, create an account with your email, and then use that same email to log into the game. And then that way you'll be able to, should you acquire assets in the future, everything will be linked up there. Awesome. We appreciate that. It looks like Andrew has got a question. Yeah. So, I mean, what's interesting about what you guys are doing is bringing multiple intellectual properties together in a single game, players own assets and then are able to use those owned assets with those multiple intellectual properties together in one place. That's great. So how do you guys see this playing out? Let's let's zoom out a little bit. What you guys are currently doing is you're focusing primarily on the, let's call it NFT gaming, game five space, right? And or NFT space and bringing those intellectual properties in. But let's zoom out two years, three years, five years. How do you see this playing out longer term? getting bigger IPs in here, uh, Star Wars, Marvel, uh, mainstream gaming IPs, et cetera, et cetera, into games like Galaxy Fight Club or, or in the future. Do you see that playing out? Do you see uh, publishers or IP owners wanting to do that? Or is there going to be major headwinds in terms of the rights around those intellectual properties? Curious to know what you guys think about that, because that's obviously how you get you mainstreamify the stuff, right? Is breaking outside this crypto gaming or crypto NFT bubble and then busting into maybe the wider space. What are your thoughts on headwinds and opportunities there? I think that's actually a great question. Um, and thanks so much for asking it. Um, I think it's awesome. Uh, I think that the development stages of the game um, also in regards to uh, obviously, the the different types of audiences that we tailor the, the, or that any game wants to tailor to come in different stages, right? And I think at the moment we are at a stage where obviously we're still testing the um, the beta, right? Uh, it's not a completely finished product yet, but we we have actually negotiated with a, a couple of these, you know, if, if we want to call them like mainstream franchises uh, or mainstream IPs. Um, and the possibilities are definitely on the table. Uh, it's not something that's 
outside of the scope of uh, possibilities or outside of you know the scope of realistic expectations for the future i just think that obviously before we can go there um the game needs to be you know a solid and finished product um obviously a game uh, is never completely finished right there's always going to be you know updates uh, bug fixes and uh, stuff like that as as you probably know from any uh, any games that you that you play um any mobas or uh, morpgs and stuff like that um it's always like an ongoing process but there comes a point in time where you can definitely say okay well this is a product that we're ready to fully launch as a finished product in that in that regard um but i think to answer your question um it definitely is something that's on the table um and i think that we definitely want to do our part and contribute towards making the web3 space more accessible to the wider um the wider space right or the 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 mainstream space or the gaming the the mainstream gaming space or whatnot um so i think that using galaxy fight club in combination with these brands or franchises is definitely going to be uh, a major opportunity to onboard uh many more people into the the web3 space even if it's just you know without them really realizing it initially uh, even if it means, you know, making the game as attractive as possible, just as a standalone game without the aspect or without the benefits of, you know, let's say the um, uh, ownership of uh, of the uh, individual assets and stuff like that, just to make it easy, easily understandable for these individuals mm. uh, and then having some sort of education process. Uh, Got it. Let, know, let's, uh, through... yeah, I think Andrew has a quick question. Let's, uh, let's get him on. Okay. <laughs> Sorry for going on a rant there. Oh, uh, no, you're good. Yeah, I I think that, uh, you know, bringing, bringing those IPs on board could be interesting. It, I guess uh, what's coming to mind for me here is these legacy gaming players are kind of, uh, many of them are clueless on how to enter the space. And Galaxy Fight Club, are you guys positioning yourselves as if you create NFTs around your legacy gaming property, whatever it is, you instantly have, let's say, utility because our game exists just by partnering with us. So you don't have to come up with, let's say, your own IP, your own utility for your NFTs, or you could just plug and play the Galaxy Fight Club game, if you will, into the utility for your NFTs. If, let's say, Tomb Raider or any of these normal games want to make NFTs around their games, do you see Galaxy Fight Club fulfilling that sort of function in the NFT gaming space where it's just like it's that thing you want on your checklist of utility around your gaming NFTs as maybe a legacy player? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, 100%. And I think that if you compare Galaxy Fight Club to other, if you want to call them like metaverse projects uh, in the space, then we have our own sort of space that we are that we have or our own like category within that space that we've created and i just genuinely i was talking to the founders of um of a project called properties the other day uh, as well as the founders of council of kings which are both projects that are building on um on sandbox and decentraland and nft worlds and stuff like that um and they're building in collaboration obviously with other projects to provide additional utility for them within those metaverse platforms, if, uh, if that's what you, what you want to call them. And they've tried so many different things uh, that they have built inside of those games or those metaverses. And they don't actually think that it's an experience that people want to enjoy or participate in on a daily basis. And I think that if you if you go down like the route of metaverse, of, or of a metaverse and the different upsides and downsides. I think that Galaxy Fight Club actually has something very special and unique about it. And that's actually being a fun to play game in the space. And people want to spend time uh, on the app and play games. And I think it's just a matter of building that out in the right way. Um, because yeah, I don't actually think that there is that many other options 
um, definitely not now, but also not in the near future, um, of things that are you know competing in that in that sort of category, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so hey, well. A, yeah, you're a, absolutely right. And it's going to be tough. I mean, to get Tomb Raider to to pull their IP in is not an easy thing. But the fact that Galaxy Fight Club has a very specific go to market, you know, people say, "Oh, you look like Brawl Stars," as if that's a bad thing. It's one of the most popular games in the world, and now it's on the blockchain. It's Web3. So in a lot of people's minds, that should be a good thing, <laughs> that you look like one of the most popular games ever. Um, you know, Getting those other video game assets in, it's like you said, it's a very easy entry. All these Web2 companies are dying to get into this space, but they need to find a meaningful way to enter it. So Galaxy Fight Club's an easy outlet. Hey, plug right into our system. Mint 10K NFTs. And you know what? We can tie the rarity of your Tomb Raider project. You, you said it. I'll use it as an example. We can tie the rarity of your Tomb Raider NFT to in-game stats in Galaxy Fight Club. That's pretty powerful. It's a, it's a matter of getting those people on the horn and figuring out which ones are most keen to do this type of thing. I know there's some Web2 non-gaming companies that are definitely looking for meaningful ways. Chipotle is always floated around. Um, easy example of integrations there is, you know, companies pay hundreds of millions of dollars to name an arena. What's to stop Galaxy Fight Club from having arena naming rights within the, the GFC universe, kind of going down that same Web 2 entering Web 3 route? We give them an easy angle to get into this space. Yeah, so that kind of brings me to transition is like, obviously you said Tomb Raider, but I don't know if we actually mentioned this earlier but square enix actually sold tomb raider in three studios to fund nft games now i don't know if you guys ever considered like being bought out that's a, another question maybe for another time but uh what impact do you think this will have in terms of like large larger game studios and why andrew what's your thoughts on that yeah, I think this is a wild and interesting move. And this is why I asked that question earlier to the Galaxy Fight Club team about these legacy gaming players are shedding their legacy gaming intellectual properties, selling them off, knowing that that's not the future. And Square Enix has been very clear about that. Not only did they lead a $2 million funding round for the Sandbox early, and they are planning on bringing Dungeon Siege to Sandbox. and But they just shed a bunch of their lower performing intellectual properties, such as Tomb Raider, also Deus Ex, uh, Legacy of Kane, and Thief. And they sold their studios, Crystal Dynamics, Eidos Montreal, and Square Enix Montreal. 1,100 employees they just shed, and all those intellectual properties they just sold off. Now, legacy gaming companies don't sell off a bunch of assets unless they're underperforming. And so this is a big indicator that legacy properties with legacy platforms and legacy business models aren't doing well. And Square Enix knows that. And so they need to basically generate capital to move into the future of gaming. And so I think that this is why I asked that question earlier to Galaxy Fight Club is they, you know, companies like this, Square Enix now have $300 million in the bank. They're looking to enter the NFT space, and they are obviously looking for high-quality partners to integrate their intellectual properties into. They already made the decision to bring Dungeon Siege into Sandbox, and maybe they would make the decision to take some of their other intellectual properties that they still own, obviously mega ones like Final Fantasy, Square Enix still has those. They're going to be looking for utility and ways to integrate those into the NFT space because they know that is the future. That is that is a huge indicator in my opinion. And I think that this Square Enix move of selling off 300 million worth of basically dying intellectual property and dying business model to move into the new business model, this is going to be the first of many shedding, if you will, of dying business models for game developers and game publishers that we're going to see in the future. We've seen a flurry of acquisitions and a flurry of, uh, let's say, uh, consolidation in the gaming industry recently. 
Microsoft, you know, buying Bethesda or whatever and buying, you know, the Activision Blizzard deal and all these things. And they've all been trying to position all of these billion dollar deals, uh, the, the Sony and Epic investment for a billion. They've all been trying to position all these deals as metaverse plays. But what they really are and what I think the Square Enix deal shows us, what they really are is their existing legacy businesses are not growing as fast as they need to. Their existing properties are not performing at the level that they need to, and they do not have as bright of an outlook moving forward. You don't sell your company. You don't sell your intellectual property. You don't sell your assets as a company when those assets are doing really well. That's not generally what happens. You sell them when you feel that they've peaked or you're past peak, and you need to dump those assets on some other sucker. And that's what I think has happened with a lot of these gaming companies. And so out of all of these examples I just brought up of Bethesda, Activision, Blizzard, Sony, Epic, what have you, Square Enix is the one legacy gaming company that appears to actually be doing NFT and actually be doing metaverse play plays right now in a meaningful and tangible way. They aren't just using the buzzword NFTs or the buzzword crypto or whatever in here to get PR, they're actually doing stuff out there like their sandbox play. And um, and so I think that this is going to position them as a leader potentially years ahead of their competitors like Ubisoft and what have you that are just dabbling in the space. And so I think a lot of legacy gaming players are gonna be looking at Square Enix as a leader on how to transition from legacy gaming into this new web three gaming world. And they're gonna be looking at their successes and failures and copying any successes that they have and doubling down on those. Let's see if their sandbox, sandbox play is a mega success and let's see what Square Enix does next. I think that they are out of all the legacy gaming companies, the strongest horse in the race right now to figure out what that new business model is of tanking your ancient gaming property, bringing it in this new world and making that into a profitable model. Mm, I totally agree with that. That uh, that was well said. And uh, Guru, uh, what, what's your thoughts on this, uh, you know, sell off of Tomb Raider legacy kind of studios? Do you see this as a bullish indicator uh, I'm already, as far as the uh, NFT space? Yeah, goes? I'm already looking for the right person on LinkedIn to reach out to. Very good. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I think you just said it extremely well. I mean, to, to jump this gap, all it takes is one person. And, you know, if we can get Cloud from FF7 into Galaxy Flight Club, then I think that would be be pretty cool. But do, uh, do you guys have any comments? You heard it here first, guys. You guys heard it here first. Cloud and Galaxy Flight Club, triple confirmed. I'm just messing around. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm just do messing you, around. <laughs> do you have contacts at Square Enix? Seems like you know what's going on over there. No, I don't. I don't have folks that are uh, that own and manage the Final Fantasy IP. No, I don't. MX, what's your thoughts on Tomb Raider being sold off by Square Enix? Are are you does that motivate you to build your game quicker, faster, development times moving up, or what's your thoughts on that? I mean, I think I just I, I think I agree with uh, what Andrew was saying. I, de I don't def I definitely don't think I could have said it any better. Um, and I think that I mean overall, I just I just think that they as a I guess like as part of a of a Web three team, I think that it was the right move. Um, you know, taking that um, shift in in directions from the let's say the Web two business model moving into Web three. Um, but I, I think it's very interesting. Um, but I think that stuff, or I think that IP that we would be more interested in getting are even. I mean, I don't want to because people are going to come back and be like, well, no, he said this and that, right? But um, <laughs> we we did talk with a couple of franchises that are like, I'd say even a step like ahead of a franchise or an IP like Tomb Raider. Um, but uh, I think that what we can learn from that is definitely that we need to pay more attention to what's going on uh, on that side of the spectrum to potentially be able to make those you know moves. 
Yeah, exactly. I think if you are obviously paying attention to like the macro, it can help you definitely make great uh, decisions moving forward. But uh, speaking of which, which is a perfect transition, uh, speaking of which, uh, the F1 Delta Time game closed up shop and goes belly up. I don't know if anybody in here was familiar with F1 Delta Time. I, I actually am. And I'm a big F1 fan myself, so I looked into this. They, I think they were on the Rev token as well. But this game was pretty expensive to get in, and you had to have spent, I think, it, thousands of dollars at one point uh, to get cars, wheels, and have basically like this whole crew built out to win races and to get like additional tokens and whatnot. But they had went belly up, uh, at least the F1 Delta time, uh, which I don't know if that's associated directly with Rev, but F1 Delta time, belly up. Uh, Andrew, what's your thoughts on this take? And is this a bad look for major brands like F1 getting into the NFT gaming space? As I've said many times, all boats rise with the rising tide and you sink with the, <laughs> you sink with the bad stuff too, right? So anytime an NFT project doesn't work out, it reflects poorly upon the entire industry. So I don't wish ill-fated uh, you know, deals or projects on anyone because it decreases uh, faith in the business model on the whole. That being said, there are so many wildly interesting insights to get from this Formula One story. So the first one is, is this. How many super successful Formula One video games exist today? Other, just period. And the answer is almost none, right? Formula One is not that popular, period. Whoa, whoa. And, well, like from a video game standpoint, it's not that popular as a video game IP historically. Like if I were to go um, look through all the historical Formula One games that have ever existed, Almost none have gone mass market or have been successful and popular, just period. They tend to be very niche games. For a niche within a niche racing community on in terms of video games, and they just aren't they just don't have mass market appeal. The Formula One brand in general and Formula One racing outside of the video game world, obviously very popular. But from a video game standpoint, never gone mass market. And so you got to look at it from that perspective first. That's the insight here. You got to look at video game projects like this as a video game first, not as an investment first, let's say. And so if as somebody looking into whether you're going to buy a $300,000 or $10,000 Formula F1 NFT to play this game, you got to be asking yourself, well, are Formula One games popular do they have a good success rate? And the answer is absolutely not. And so there's, there's, you know, so then you have to look at this game and go, well, what's going to make this Formula One game mass market or have longevity or what have you when other Formula One games have not? Well, maybe it's the NFT element. I don't know, guys. I feel like that's a huge risk and that's like a major miscalculation from anybody who is kind of considering this one, let's say from an investment standpoint, not investment advice. So I think that it's really important to look at a game, to look at the genre, and for just to look at a video game as a video game and look at it from its viability in, in that regard first and see whether it's likely or unlikely that that video game put the NFT side and the investment side to the side and consider it just as a video game first. Um, I would certainly not uh, bet on any Formula One video game ever going mass market, um, just period. And, and just in general, racing games in general are a very, very niche market of game, just generally. And Formula One is a niche within a niche. And uh, and you might be saying, hold on, there are popular racing games. Yes, there are. But compared to mainstream gaming, like actual mainstream games, if you look at the revenue and the player base of almost every racing game, it's minuscule. It's tiny. These are like the footnote games for major studios when they do their rollouts, right? So that's point number one. Point number two is now that the game shut down, we really get to see what happens when people drop lots of money into a, uh, an NFT game and then what happens afterwards. 
And what's really interesting here is that they ended up taking the value, and I don't know how much value people are losing, but people that owned F1 NFTs can get like some generic replacement tokens for an entirely different racing game instead now, which is I which is interesting to me as like a maybe something to potentially expect if people invest in or get tokens for or have NFTs for a failing game, what happens after that? Does all the value vaporize? Well, in this case, um, they pro they're providing F1 Delta time, replacement cars and race pass and track vouchers and things like that for a different game. Now, I doubt that all of the value people invested in this main F1 game are gonna transfer over, but it's interesting that there is at least some transfer opportunity for people that invested in this game and want to continue to participate in the Formula One IP. So you might say, wow, a lot of people lost a lot of money here. And that's probably true. But think about every other video game that anybody's ever played. You always lose 100% of your money in every video game prior to the NFT and crypto space. So at least in this case, you could retain some value. Uh, so I think that that's somewhat of a silver lining, perhaps not so much for the people that dropped hundreds of thousands, of course. So I just think this is a wildly interesting case study on the importance of the game, the potential market of the game, and then what happens after a game dies, because I think we're going to see a lot more of this. 90% of games that are in the market right now uh, obviously will fail and go out of business statistically. Uh, and this shows us a sneak preview of what goes down with major intellectual properties. Yeah, that's really well said. I think it actually, to, to add a bit, ties back to what you were saying before uh, about Galaxy Fight Club and these IPs having a safe place to enter the space, the NFT world, through Galaxy Fight Club, whereas F1, I, I said, whoa, whoa, just because I love F1. Um, not the games. Look, but, I'm not uh, fudding F1. F1's wildly popular. <laughs> I'm just saying, I, if, you look, if you look at all the Formula One games ever, it's usually super niche. And then it's guys that'll like spend like $300 on like a racing wheel in their hardcore racing setup on their PC and stuff at home. And yeah. it's like very much older 30, 40, 50 year old whales that play those sorts of games. It's very niche. Yeah, shout out Cruz in America for best racing game. But I think another super important point of this is it was really expensive to get into, right? And, you know, I don't want to speak for them, but maybe it wasn't the most, you know, thorough, thought out project. NFTs are its own entirely new dynamic where the fact that you and, and GFC is building from within the NFT world and then moving outwards, you start with that burning hot center the scholars, the guilds, the whole NFT ecosystem, and you build out from there. Uh, but the fact that it it didn't have a, I don't think it had a free-to-play aspect. So, you know, just the, the contrast, Galaxy Fight Club has the free-to-play. Um, the point you made, <clears throat> it must be a standalone game. It doesn't, it shouldn't have to have anything to do with NFTs. That's icing on the cake. Uh, you really can't half-ass this stuff. I don't think that that was, you know, something that they had a 10 year vision for that game. I, I doubt they did. Um, and, you know, shows you, you might need to partner with someone who's already in these NFT waters to, to really make this work. And then you need to build where people are. They built it on rev. What is rev? So I think that's a big red flag. You, you're trying to get people onto this whole new chain. In addition to getting them onto a whole new game, in addition to making them pay to play, that's just never going to work out. Um, so yeah, tons of red flags there. I think you said you guys are building on immutable GFC is building on polygon on Matic, which had massive news come out yesterday. Meta has chosen polygon. So, you know, tons of synergies there. I'll just throw it out there just for fun. Um, bullish on the term synergies, uh, no pun intended for Illumium, but yeah, yeah. Go, proceed. Synergies. <laughs> Over just for fun, over under twelve months before you can buy Galaxy Fight Club assets on the Facebook Marketplace. 
I'm taking. That's the, not an official announcement. That's a super no, fan that's announcement, an over right, under. MX? That's an over under. <laughs> it's an over under. <laughs> yeah. I'm, no. I, I, so I'm, Final I'm, Fantasy confirmed. Facebook integration confirmed. Zuckerberg confirmed. Well, wow, so many confirmations so today. <laughs> there is a confirmation that Meta and Polygon, and Elon confirmed. <laughs> Meta, Meta, no, and, Meta and Polygon have teamed up. So that's one yeah. Thing. So it, it would be. I, I believe it was. Polygon, Ethereum, and to flow in another chain as well. Yeah, absolutely. So you know, we're we're talking GFC here, so I'm I'm kind of keeping it specific to us, but uh, that's a big big bit of news as far as getting this out to the masses. Uh, you know, the goal, like I said, like you said, the game just has to be standalone by itself without anything to do with NFTs, and then. When crypto truly goes mainstream, people won't really know that it's crypto because the UI has improved so much. So that's that's where the whole space needs to move to is where this is just the back end of what's going on. And you would never know it has anything to do with NFTs or crypto is when things truly go mainstream. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that's, that's well said there. And I, I agree. I think the game... The F1 game was quite steep to get into, um, is, which is why I didn't play it personally. Uh, I was excited to play it, uh, but when I saw the price tag to get into it, I was I said no. Uh, and Andrew, let's uh, go back to you. Yeah, something to add here. And for anybody out there that wants to kind of, this is not financial advice. This is just research advice. If you want to understand... Uh, a cash grab. Um, I'm not saying Formula One did a cash grab here, but it looks an awful lot like a cash grab uh, mobile game play. So what's going to happen here in the NFT space, and this is going to be that 90% failure rate I was talking about earlier, these companies that were active or have looked at the mobile gaming space and how cash grabs work there in mobile games they're going to repeat that model here in the NFT space because it works. And here's the formula. You guys ready? It's the same. It's been the same formula for the last eight years. You license an intellectual property that is trusted. Check Formula One Racing. You then generate an a below average copy paste game uh, that you then insert the intellectual property you licensed on top of. Uh, I'm not saying this Formula One racing game did that, but it's possible. I don't know. I don't. I, I, but that's the formula. Got it? That's number two. You don't really make a new video game. You just take an existing video game and slap that intellectual property on top. Great. Then number three, you have no future plans to support the game outside of the launch window post three to six months afterwards. And you have the prices of everything be incredibly high at the beginning. That's step number three. And then step number four is 50% of your budget is marketing. Got it? So trusted IP, copy-paste video game, overpriced, juice the marketing. Then you launch it, you suck all the value out of the market, and you bounce the fuck out. That is the model that's been used hundreds and hundreds of times, maybe thousands of times in the mobile gaming space. Trusted IPs have been used, abused, and discarded over and over again on mobile games where they'll license the Star Wars IP, for example, copy-paste it on top of some other video game, sell you a bunch of overpriced loot boxes, you drop a couple hundred bucks in, and oh, they're shutting down the video game three to six months later with no post-game support. If you see that playing out in the nft or crypto gaming space watch out and get the heck out of there this is the playbook that's worked in mobile gaming and i guarantee you it will be repeated hundreds and thousands of times here in nft gaming and here's the here's the bad part people will be willing to invest more money per person this time right so as we saw in the formula one example some people bought some of these cars for like ten thousand bucks some people did like transactions of over 300k Doing a transaction of 300K in a mobile game was almost impossible, right? But now it is possible with these NFTs because it's like this pseudo investment. And so these are major red flags for people to watch out for. 
And so I've said this before in previous episodes of Aluva Talks, and I'll say it again. Licensed intellectual properties are something that people should be very careful about if an, if a game is entirely based on like one property. Um, this is a formula for mediocre performance to below average performance for a video game. Now, where Galaxy Fight Club is different is they they're adding value by bringing 5, 10, 20, 100, maybe infinity intellectual properties together in a new, let's call it marketplace game and experience. I'm not referring to that. I'm referring to one trusted intellectual property where it's a lazy cash grab. And I'm not saying the Formula One team did a cash grab, but it sure as heck looks like that. And I wanted to highlight and break down that cash grab model for everyone so that you can be wary if you see those. Generally speaking, original value, original games, new concepts, new intellectual property have a higher probability of success and longer term viability than licensed intellectual property. Case in point, once again. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely well put. And yeah, I think we'll see more of that play out. As you mentioned, like it is an age old trick, I guess, if you will, just copy and paste. So that is one thing that would be concerning, but I don't think that's necessarily going to go away uh, just because we're implementing NFT, you know, back end technology into games. I think that that formula is still going to be there. And I think even when it comes to some indie studios, I think they'll continue to make some mistakes. I think as time goes on, uh, as you mentioned earlier, Andrew, is that there's going to be hopefully, and MX might have said this as well, some use, you know, some case studies that we could learn from to not do that again because it is a unique experience, like in the NFT space. And what you know, Galaxy Fight Club is doing is unique internally, you know, in the NFT space, and then widening out. I think that's good for you know early movers in the space currently. And uh, but yeah, for something like F1 Delta Time. It just started off on the wrong foot to begin with, and it seemed like it was just kind of destined for failure uh, with not a lot of you know, people playing the game. It just seemed like it was set up for uh, somewhat of failure there. But uh, yeah, so any, uh, any alpha that we can get from the Galaxy Fight Club? Uh, do you guys have anything coming down the near future uh, as well, just out of curiosity? Um, so I think we have a couple of things coming up in the near future, um, which is not necessarily alpha, but maybe maybe I'll drop something new um, afterwards. But uh, we have, as I mentioned earlier, our PDE system uh, going live in July. We have our um, cross IP championship uh, where all these different IPs and different projects are going to come together and battle it out for a price pool of... Uh, 250,000 to 500,000 US dollars worth of different assets. Um, and yeah, we, we're going to have a bunch of crazy teams participating. Um, obviously, one, gonna, uh, one of our OG partners, CyberKongs, is participating, um, as well as some other big names like um, uh, some, some streamers and people kind of uh, can figure out like the couple of people that we've been interacting with recently. Um, also talking to Vayner Sports at the moment, which is kind of cool. Uh, and we're also doing some other stuff with them. So I think the next couple of months are definitely going to be very exciting for Galaxy Fight Club. Um, and then, and I actually don't think I mentioned this yet, but um, for anyone in the audience or anyone who's listening uh, back into the, the, the recording and is going to be at NFT NYC, uh, we're actually going to be doing um, a small... Uh, event kind of thing there, uh, which I don't want to um, yeah, say too much about just yet, but uh, we are definitely doing something um, also in collaboration with our partners. And yeah, just really looking forward to uh, what's coming up. Very cool. Well, that sounds all exciting and I'm very interested to play the game and I'm excited about uh, you know, the Arlen, you know, character as well and playing with that. Hopefully I'll be able to get one on the secondary. But um, yeah, thanks for joining today. And uh, any final words, Andrew, or any anything that you can think of uh, as we close out? Land, land, landy, land, landy, land, landy, land.
alluvium.io slash land. Go there, register to stay up to date with our land sale. Land sale is coming up very, very soon. Be prepared. Alluvium.io slash land. Go, you'll get the information. You can enter your email. Ensure you get notified when our land sale goes live. And we have a lot more land um, communications uh, showing the different regions, uh, showing off uh, even new art that we're putting together for Alluvium Zero for all the different buildings for managing your land. We've got tier five land events coming up. It's it's going to be nuts. Land, landy, freaking landy land. And also there's some trivia coming up in Discord, right, Kyle? Yeah, absolutely. Uh so we have a trivia in Discord hosted by our community manager, Rich, and that starts at 2100 UTC or 5 p.m. Eastern time in the Alluvium voice channel. And if you can't participate in the voice, you can simply do that. They actually have a uh, voice text channel as well labeled Alluvium voice text. So if you want to join right or at least at 5 p.m. Eastern time, you can do so in the Alluvium official Discord in don't forget to check out more about the land in the Discord as well, in the official announcement channels. And there also is the new region uh, medium article as well. If you want to check out the first ever guide to that region, you can check that out as well on the medium article. Andrew, back to you. I just, the last thing I want to say is I'm really rooting for the Galaxy Fight Club team uh, to prove the idea that you can bring multiple intellectual properties together in one experience and have that be viable. And if your team, I feel like you guys are like the phase one soldiers, the, the explorers marching out to the West, insert your analogy of the people kind of trailblazing that. If you guys are able to be successful with that model, that can help, I think, be the case study to unlock that like fantasy ready player one idea that we would all want one day in the metaverse where you can be you know a transformer playing next to tracer from overwatch playing next to darth vader next to you millennium falcon is behind you like insert all of the best intellectual properties ever you're all in one experience we all want that to be the future of gaming and metaverse and we want that obviously interoperability and all of those intellectual properties to be together in one to, to elevate our experiences to the next level. And so I really want Galaxy Fight Club to be that case study or one of those case studies to show that that can work and that brands and intellectual property owners can collaborate with each other and they can benefit by having their brand interacting with other, maybe even competitor brands. So I really am rooting for you guys and I appreciate you guys coming on Aluva Talks. Great. Yeah, it looks like we're all out of time. And once again, we appreciate you for, for being on. And, and we'll have to have you guys on at a later point in time. But for this one, we're going to close it out. And we appreciate all the listeners down here in the audience and everybody watching or listening to the replay. We will be here next week. Same time, same place. New guests. We'll see you guys later. Thanks so much, guys.